Second Timothy 3, verse 1 to 5. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. Now, you may have heard of the word narcissism. What is it? Narcissism is a mental condition which gives someone a sense of superiority or importance over others with an extreme need for attention, affection, and admiration from other individuals. It's a state that in the medieval times, it helped people to conquer nations and to do uncommon things. But in this day and age, in the light of God's word, is practically unacceptable. Now, every one of us, to an extent, manifests some of these traits. When you have it in a smaller measure and when it's not detrimental to other people's aspiration, there's nothing wrong. It's good to see yourself the way God sees you. It's good to feel good about yourself. But when it's channeled, when it's weaponized and you reach yourself higher than others to the detriment of the collective aspirations simply means something is wrong. The superiority complex syndrome is caused by low self-esteem and inadequacy. The fragile ego of narcissists creates intolerance and causes them to react badly to criticisms. You know, the, the hardcore narcissist feels special. There's nothing wrong feeling special. But when you think that you've been placed above certain people and they are inferior to you, then something is wrong. Before God, no race is more superior to the other. No group of persons are more superior to others. God's got no favorites. There's the God of Africa, the God of Asia, the God of Europe, the God of the Americas, the God of Australia, the God of Antarctica. But the truth is, when you get to a certain point in your life, when you begin to think that you're better than some other people, and that you're the perfection of beauty, then something is wrong. When you get to a point in your life, when you think that you possess the monopoly of knowledge and anyone's opinion is inferior, that means something is wrong. The apostle said, we know in parts. Apostle Paul was one of the most learned men that ever lived. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a scribe of the scribes. He knew his mental powers were outstanding. He was a man who had an encounter with Jesus. His spiritual powers were astounding. Yet, he humbled himself. He said, we know in parts. When you give no room to people who have opposing views, simply means you're a tyrant. Because in learning the way people feel, in trying to understand them, that's what makes you human. When you lack empathy and you say it's either me or highway or hell way, then something is radically wrong. Look at what we've created in our planet. 
In the first world war, millions of people, countless lives died because of the fragile ego of some leaders. The second world war was caused by a crazy lunatic who believed, driven by a low service team. Germany was battered from the first world war. He needed to give his people a reason. You can motivate your people into battle, but not at someone's expense. Someone with this trait does not even take responsibility for the things they've done wrong. I fail because the system is bad. I got bankrupt because the system is bad. My country is in a mess because some strangers that leaves among us, they're the cause. That's the way weaklings think. That's the way cowards think. A real person, a real warrior, a real soldier takes responsibility. I have never in my life blamed people for anything I'm going through because I know by faith in God, I am the architect of my destiny. You're the architect of your destiny. Greatness lies in you. You have the power of choice to choose failure or success. Anytime God wants to interact with people, God is all powerful, God is all great, but he never imposed his will on anyone. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, it's always your choice. A narcissist does not give you a choice. He imposes his will on you. He tells you he's the greatest. He's so infatuated with himself that he practically looks at the mirror all all the time. Mirror, mirror, who's the finest? Me, 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 me. That's why marriages are breaking. That's why society is split. That's why nations go into civil war. This crazy lunatic told the people of Germany, he said, the Jews are responsible for all our crises. And for us to become a better place, we have to get rid of them. Millions of people died. The Holocaust would have been prevented. Sometimes when bad people do bad things and good people keep quiet, Bad things reign. We can't be silent over the nonsense that we've seen in the 21st century. The whole world hit by a pandemic, which automatically affected the global economy. No matter how great you are as a leader, if you have no self-control, you are not a leader. You're a failure. He who must lead others must first Lead himself. Self-control is the greatest asset of any leader. A leader must learn to listen. A leader must learn to know what it means to be a subject. That was why Jesus, my role model, he came and became human. What greater privilege and what greater humility is bigger than divinity taking the form of humanity in order to save you from you? You cannot save a people you don't understand. You cannot rescue a people you don't understand. You need to understand what it means to be in that position. One of the reasons Alexander the Great became one of the greatest leaders that ever lived, unlike medieval leaders, he didn't live in the palace. He lived among his troops. He lived with the soldiers. He was rugged. Because a leader who can leave his comfort zone and live among the people is a leader who is going to conquer the world. This is why populist movements rose all over the place. But well, that's what I called false populism. You tell the people, I'm one of you. You get their votes. As soon as you get there, we are different. The desire to be great is a desire that God has put inside of us. That means there's nothing wrong about your desire to be great. But well, why do you need power? If you need power to punish people and to settle scores, 
then you've destroyed the principles of power. Why do you need power? Power is to serve. Power is to empower the weak. Power is to save. Power is to transform. You don't seek position for the fun of feeling good. You seek certain positions because you want to use power to help. Narcissists may act civilized and polite to lure people into their orbit. They react in the most primitive and ruthless manner when they feel threatened because self-preservation is the dominant philosophy. What does God tell us? What does the, the scripture say? The greatest must be the servant of them all. In the kingdom, if you want to be great, you must possess the capacity to serve. A narcissist thinks that the body of that lady does not belong to the lady, that I'm special, and that means whatever I, I, I need, you have to give it to me because it's my right. And if the lady says I'm not in the mood, he's, he's going to rape her, but for the narcissist, that's not rape. How dare you say no to me? And how do you think that advertising agencies and music industries were able to turn innocent women into sexual monsters? Why do you think that was possible? Because of narcissism. Because the idea is if a predator wants to destroy prey, they isolate the prey from the herd. There's safety in a herd. So the predator lures the prey outside the herd. Isolate. Narcissists do that. And the entertainment industry has seen a lot of this. Anybody who wants to exhibit his or her talent with nudity is a fool of the highest grade. It shows how much you value your body. Your body is God's temple. And you must put reverence to your body. Because by magnifying your body, you magnify God. I have traveled to different parts of the world. And I've seen the same problem. You need someone to tell you that you're beautiful. You need someone to tell you you just want to do things. No one understands me. The natural human state is cruel. And if you want to do things in life, you have to renew your mind. The Bible tells me in the book of Jeremiah 17 verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That means the natural human instinct is wickedness. The heart can conceive so many things. And the heart can tell you that what you're thinking of is good. I don't have a problem. Psalm 36 verse 3. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. 2 Timothy 3.13 but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We are in that era. How come you turn away from the truth? I was telling someone, I said, anybody who advises you, who tells you the truth, without expecting anything from you, is your true friend. But the ones who tell you things because they want to gain, watch it. I was talking to someone. I said, what do you think you can possibly give to me? 
I don't preach because I want you to think in a certain way that's beneficial to me. I preach because I want you to think the way God wants you to think. That's beneficial to God and to the human race. A narcissist is going to tell you to do things that makes him the center of your existence. They turn parents against children. They turn children against parents. Young people, be careful. Our parents ain't perfect. But they told us things that helped us to become we. Especially the young generation, you think parents are crazy. Look at what the world has become. Now, let me tell you something. You had the best education. No generation was educated like the millennials. True or false? Yet when it comes to productivity, they are at the bottom of the ladder. Someone said education is the key. How come it did not work for the millennials? Because their minds, many of them, their minds are twisted. Let me tell you, no dad or mom is perfect. But most parents would rather die, give up their lives for their children. So it is foolish to rebel against them. They set the pace for you. Today, some of the things that God has given to me, the foundation of this successful path, the route, was put in place by my dad. Was he perfect? No. Was my mom perfect? No. But they told us truth. Your friends tell you to challenge your parents and you think that's right? I'm an adult. Be very careful. Colossians 2.8 Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, not according to Christ. If there is a conflict between God's truth and what narcissists desire to be the truth, they will turn against God. A narcissist comes to church not to hear God's truth, but to try to bend God's truth to carry out the agenda. So if you say something that is contrary to what they perceive to be truth or believe to be truth, that day they are going to leave the church. They'll tell you this preacher is preaching nonsense. They'll leave because it contradicts what they believe. We do not come here to validate our error. We come here to be corrected. We come here to know the truth. What you know that can set you free is not the truth. At best, it's just knowledge, acquired knowledge. While acquired knowledge can take care of your ignorance, it does not mean it can really, really set your mind free. Because some of the craziest people today I've known are educated people. So education is not the key to mental transformation. It is your ability to surrender to a superior truth. When there is a conflict between your passion and your purpose, let passion not nullify your purpose. Let purpose rule over passion. When there is a conflict between your faith and your fear, let faith have the last say. When there is a conflict between your intellectual knowledge and God's truth, let God's truth have the final say. Romans 16, 18. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. There is nothing wrong with having a confident mental attitude and regarding yourself as special, but you must do this with the understanding of God's love, grace, and mercy. We are what we are by God's grace and not by 
a personal effort. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I. But the grace of God which was with me. You are what you are by God's grace. And so that means God must always take the center of your thoughts. In him we live. In him we dwell. In him we have the totality of our being. Romans 1, 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. The reason your mind is debased, the reason your mind is damaged is because you did not like to retain God's truth. Your mind cannot be damaged if God's truth is your standard of truth. You can't have an alternative truth. What we have in the world now, you have two conflicts, the liberal truth and the conservative truth. And Christians foolishly say, uh, let's go into the liberal truth. Uh, let's go into the conservative truth. They lean towards the, the, the right because they think they're the right. Shameless manifestation of things. You take sides. We're supposed to be mediators. We have, we have this ministry of reconciliation. We reconcile the world back to God. We don't play partisan politics. We tell the world the truth. We don't say I'm left or right. Our principles must be predicated on the principles of God's word. I look at some of my brother's shameless display of piety. They talk about, they cry about abortion. They cry about many things. But when it comes to the killing of colored people, black people, Latinos, Asians, the same preachers who were so bold in preaching so many things, they keep quiet. There is nothing like alternative truth. There is nothing like partial truth. There is nothing like selective truth. We propagate absolute truth. The word of God is true. It is infallible. It is absolute. God's truth anywhere can stand the test of time. The sun can set in Japan and the same sun can set in Africa. That's God's truth. There is day and there is night. That's God's infallible truth. He made them male and female. When they come together, they reproduce. That's God's truth on marriage. God's truth is absolute. Because it's proven. It's timeless. It is the truth. Hallelujah. And until you know that truth, you can never be set free. Second Samuel 22 verse 27. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. And with the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. Second Thessalonians 2.11 And for this reason, God will send strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Have you not wondered why people make lies? The truth? The gospel of lies. It has crept into the body of Christ. The concept of hell and heaven is already an old-fashioned thing. And some shameless preachers, uh, they want to preach that there's nothing like hell. Hell has become a figure of speech. The same hell that Jesus described? Are you kidding me? There is only one truth. God's word is true. God's word is true. It is tried. It is tested. Symptoms of narcissism. Narcissists exhibit the following symptoms. Exaggerated self-importance. Extreme entitlement mindset. They expect people to recognize them as superior even when they have no notable achievement. Exaggerated accomplishments. Relate with people arrogantly and rudely. Discriminate against people deemed inferior to them. Manipulative and deceptive. 
They have unreasonably high and unrealistic expectations from others and play the victim when they don't get what they want. They have little control over their emotions and behavior, especially when provoked. They monopolize conversations and talk a lot, which makes them sometimes habitual liars. They lack empathy, self-centered, and vindictive. Narcissistic leaders are most times ruthless and oppressive. Their pride and lack of reverence for God sometimes attract divine punishment. Have you noticed in the Old Testament, even before the Old Testament, the periods within that, those dark ages, you had leaders who were narcissists. They abused power so much that they told the subjects to create images for them and they say, I am a God. Now, some modern day politician is going to say, I, I, I didn't say I'm a God, but you portray yourself to be a superman on, on, on social media. Some of you even put wings around you and you call yourself the superman of, 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 of this nation's politics or any other nation you didn't fit. Watch it. We can do nothing without God. The Bible says, what have you received that you did not get from God? And if indeed you received it from God, why boast as if it's of your own making? Acts chapter 12, 21 to 23. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of God and not of a man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and he was eating up by worms and died. This is what may likely happen to you. God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. A humble, godly person would have said, no, don't call me God. I'm just human. He probably gave them the impression that he was a God. Thank God. For those God's given oratory powers. Well, we can only do things that God's gifted us to do. And we give him all the glory. You know, I was watching one of these movies, medieval movies. And this ancient emperor was talking. And his advisor told him, he said, emperor, this is against the interest of the state. He shouted, he said, shut up. I am the state. This is how narcissists think. Life begins and ends with them. Daniel 4, 28 to 32. All this came upon Nebuchadnezzar at the end of the 12 months. He was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you until you know the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. You are where you are because God chose you. Because God's favor was upon you. So never forget that the reason why you're standing is because God put you there. But a narcissist we think that I did this by myself. What do you have that God's not giving to you? The Bible tells me in the book of Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogance, and the evil way, and the perverse mouth I hate. There's what I call spiritual narcissism. When you get to a point when you think that you have had great understanding, you know everything about God, and every other group is inferior to the knowledge you have. That's dangerous. 
Spiritual narcissism promotes religious intolerance, persecution, and violence. You get to a point where you think that you know everything. And so this person who doesn't follow what you believe is an enemy. We also have collective narcissism. When a whole society begins to think that, you know, we are special. And we need to invade this other group of people because we're better than them. We have racial narcissism that promotes racism. We have intellectual narcissism, economic narcissism that makes you think that you know everything. You have to be careful so that you don't end up doing things that are inappropriate. So to a certain measure, we all are prone to these traits. But the type of person you want to be depends on how you handle yourself. It depends on what you want to do with yourself. You can be a better person. You can know all and still be humble. You can have all the grace to do uncommon things and still be humble. Always remind yourself that I am what I am by the grace of God. So how can we overcome this spirit? Six ways to overcome narcissism. One, acknowledge your narcissistic behavioral pattern. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Say, examine yourselves. You know, the Bible, the word of God is a mirror. It gives you an idea of how a person should be. Don't try to explain the things you're doing wrong by saying, I'm human. Jesus came so that our human frailty can be converted to divine attributes. Examine yourselves. Most of the charitable deeds I have done, 99.999% were done in secret. Never ever make yourself the center of attraction. It is a privilege to stand before God's presence. It is a privilege to preach his word. That is enough honor. Hallelujah. The Bible tells me in the book of 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? Jesus lives in you. Don't you know you carry Jesus, the King of Kings? The Bible says, I stand at the door of your heart. And if you open, I'm going to sup with you. How can you carry Jesus and still dishonor yourself with your actions, with your words, and with your thoughts? When we were small, there were certain slangs that my dad didn't expect us to use. He said these slangs are spoken by people who are not sound offensive so when my dad is home we make sure that our language is refined oh come on don't look at me as if you didn't do it <laughs> hallelujah right but as soon as daddy leaves the house we say certain things and someone reminds daddy is around oh, oh, oh. and everyone keeps quiet so the, the truth is do you not know that God lives in you. Can you afford to carry God and say some of the things you say? Be conscious of the fact that God lives in you. If in your home, you can't call your children Gagu because Bishop Tony is around, then try not to call them Gagu because God, who is much more greater than me, lives in you. Be conscious of the fact that you carry Jesus. 
Measure your words with wisdom. Measure the things you say. Two, admit that you have manifested some of the traits of a narcissistic person. Proverbs 28 verse 13. He who covers his sins will not prosper. Do you want to prosper? Say so don't cover it up. Confess and renounce it. He who covers the sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Say mercy. Mercy is a prerogative of grace. Say mercy. You know why I choose the older generation, not the younger ones? But I love the younger generations. The older generation, when they scold us, we don't argue with our parents. We change. These other ones begin to question you. Why do you want me to do this? You turn your home into a parliamentary debate session. If you were so good in debate, why didn't you win the regional high school debate competition? Shame on you. When it comes to texting your parents, you send them long, aggressive, rude text messages, yet you failed your English essay. Where do you think this rebellion is going to get you? And so what if your dad made mistakes? Abraham made mistakes. So what? David made mistakes. The Bible didn't say we should copy the examples, the wrong examples of our parents, but we should learn from them. A humble person increases knowledge. He learns and he grows stronger. May God change your attitude in the mighty name of Jesus. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is not late. Confess it. Confess the wrong attitude. Confess the wrong behavior. And God is faithful to cleanse you and to take you to the next level of glory. In the mighty name of Jesus. Three, sincerely desire to change. Have you noticed that every time Jesus healed people, he would always ask them a question. Do you want to be made whole? Church, I ask you a question today. Do you want to be made whole? You know those who say, leave us alone. They are the ones influenced by demons. Have you noticed that many people that Jesus met who did not have demons, they ran to Jesus. Help us, son of David. But those who had demons, what have you to do with us? Leave us alone. Leave us alone is the hallmark of demonic activities. Those with demons, we always say, leave us alone. I don't want to hear But those born of God's spirit, born of God's influence, they'll say, I will arise. Say, I will arise. And go back to my father's house. I will arise. The prodigal son looked at himself. He said, this is not where I belonged. I rebelled against my purpose. I rebelled against many things. But I will arise and go back to my father's house. Sometimes you think the bridge between your father or your mentor is so big. We do not agree all the time. We fight all the time. You're wrong. If you make the first step, God is going to touch the heart of your parents and will meet you midway. The Bible says when the father saw the prodigal son coming from afar, he ran towards the son. You know, I don't know where you got this wrong concept. I'm not taking sides, but I'm saying the decent thing, the godly thing to do is, I don't know what the problem is. Make an effort. Fathers, make an effort to reach out to your children. Children, make an effort to reach out to the fathers. 
please don't sponsor bills where children divorce parents. Some countries are doing that. Don't ever do that. That is against the ethics of God's word. Four, seek God's help and the support of godly people. If you notice these traits in your life, seek God's help and the support of godly people. Psalm 34, verse 4 to 5. I sought the Lord, and he heard me. So when you seek God, what does he do? He hears you. Do you want to seek God's face? It's going to give you victory. Do you want to seek him? I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. When you put your trust in God, God is going to lift you up. God is going to promote you. And God is going to deliver you from all your fears. Five, get the services of professional counselors and mental health experts. Proverbs eleven fourteen: Where there is no counsel, the people fail. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Then finally, change your belief system and negative mental attitude. Every man is a product of his most dominant thought. What dominates your mind will direct your actions and determine the course of your destiny. It is from the mind. Change the way you think. See people the way God sees them. Don't see them as inferior or less inferior. See them the way God sees them. We are all God's children. Whether you are brown, black, red, blue, whatever name you want to call yourself, we are all God's children. Whether you have degree or you don't have your degree, we are all God's children. Begin to see people the way God sees them. Romans 12, 1-2, which is the biggest key to your deliverance and victory in this area. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be confirmed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So how do you attain this? You renew your mind. Is someone blessed in God's presence? How many of you have some of these traits? One, two, three, or some of the traits of narcissism? I'm not going to ask you to lift up your hands. (laughs) Hallelujah. I want you to stand to your feet. The greatest love anyone can have is the love of God. Moderate your activities. Know that God loves you. You don't need to be outrageous to be righteous. All you need is the assurance. I've always said a crown does not make a king. It is the king that gives relevance to any crown. I don't need positions to define me. Uh, You know, I traveled to India and you have hundreds of thousands of people as a minister to hundreds of that huge crowd like the Benny Hinn thing. And I find it so cute when they introduce me. Let's welcome brother Tony. That's the best honor I think anyone's given to me because I felt at home. I was honored to be one of them. And the best title you can give to someone is the brotherhood title. Hallelujah. When someone says, you're my brother, it's the biggest title. Someone tells you, you're my sister. It's the biggest title. Amen. But thank God that we serve a God of goodness, a God of mercy. Anybody who's not going to accept you because you did not do outrageous things, such people are not fit to be your friends. 
The Bible tells me a friend loves at all. Even when your makeup is falling off. He loves at all. I come as a messenger. A messenger must reflect the will. The sovereign will of his master. A messenger cannot say, I'm ashamed. It's all about me. This is not about me. Whether I like to face the crowd or not, it has nothing to do with me. It is about the message. The message that my father sent me. And for that, even if he tells me to go, do you know there was a time God told the prophet in the Bible, he said, go prophesy all over the nation. You know what he told the prophet? You will prophesy naked. Did he tell you to prophesy naked? Say, thank God for grace. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank God for grace, Bishop Cardin. Only God knows what some of us would have done. Thank God for grace. If those prophets were narcissists, they would have said, never. God, on this note, we part ways. God has called you to be unique. God has called you to be godly. God's truth is your truth. Say this after me. Say, I am special. I'm the apple of God's eyes. I'm born of God's spirit. I am an overcomer. From this moment, I choose God's truth over my fears, over my doubts, over my insecurity. I am what and who God says I am. Give someone a high five. Hallelujah.